OK, let's begin this week's uh, discussion. 13 to 16, so uh, this is the beginning of the second half of the novel. Persuasion was originally published in two volumes. Uh, we split right down the middle between chapters 12 and 13. And so originally the first volume ended uh, after the accident and Captain Wentworth uh, goes off in search of help. Uh, it's a very dramatic ending. So now we begin the second volume and you may notice when you were reading this that the two volumes don't feel exactly the same. The first volume seems more focused on uh, Anne's thoughts and feelings, her relationship with her family, the other people in her life, with the returned Captain Wentworth. Uh, the second volume is more focused on events, looking towards Anne's future. So let's look at the questions. Question one, how does Anne resolve the awkwardness of having to mention Captain Wentworth to Lady Russell? Why do you think her solution works? So let's take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Let's see, where is this? Ah, there was a little here. There was a little awkwardness at first in their discourse on another subject. They must speak of the accident at Lyme, right? This is the big thing that happened. So as soon as Anne meets Lady Russell, of course she has to tell Lady Russell this happened. Um, Lady Russell had not been arrived five minutes the day before when a full account of the whole, the entire situation, had burst on her, which means someone had in a rush told her what happened. But still it must be talked of. She must make inquiries. She must regret the imprudence, lament the result, and Captain Wentworth's name must be mentioned by both. So even though Lady Russell already knows what happened, uh, social etiquette, being polite, requires that they still have to talk about it. Uh, because even though Lady Russell knows, she has not talked about it with Anne. And of course, Anne is a very important person uh, in the events of the accident. So still it must be talked of. She, Lady Russell, must make inquiries, which means she has to ask after, oh, like how is Louisa now? How is everyone else doing? What's going on? To ask questions, to make inquiries. The American spelling of this word begins with I, not E. Continuing, she must regret the imprudence, which means she has to say uh, that Louisa was imprudent, uh, and must regret the fact that she is so imprudent. So she has to give a kind of moral judgment on what happened. Uh, and she has to also lament the result, which means, oh, it's too bad that this happened. So even though these are all obvious, uh, obviously the correct emotions and reactions, Lady Russell, because, to be polite, still has to actually say them. And because they talk about this, uh, Captain Wentworth's name must be mentioned by both. And this causes Anne some awkwardness. Continuing, Anne was conscious of not doing it so well as Lady Russell. So whenever she mentions Captain Wentworth, it, there's always a sense of awkwardness uh, when Anne says his name. She could not speak the name and look straight forward to Lady Russell's eye. Uh, so because she's so awkward about this name, she can't look her in the eye as she says the name. Uh, till she had adopted the expedient, the the uh, tactic, the the way, the strategy of telling her, Lady Russell, briefly what she thought of the attachment between him and Louisa. So here, attachment means relationship, because remember, everyone thought that Captain Wentworth and Louisa would be married uh, because they got along so well together. 
Uh, and so when Ant, when this was told, when Anne talked about Captain Wentworth in this way, his name distressed her no longer. So to return to the original question, Anne resolves the awkwardness uh, by talking not just about Wentworth, uh, but always talking about Wentworth in relation to Louisa. And why does this work? Why does this make her less awkward when talking about his name? Well, first of all, we know that the reason she is awkward is because mentioning Wentworth is uh, another uh, chance to think about their past history together, uh, the fact that he is now back from the dead, so to speak. Um, it's all just very awkward. And of course, Lady Russell uh, from the beginning was also opposed to Anne's uh, engagement with Captain Wentworth, uh, even though Anne loved him very much. So bringing this up in front of Lady Russell is also uh, even more awkward. So the way that Anne solved this is by reminding them both that everyone thought that Wentworth would marry Louisa. If he marries Louisa, then you know it's no longer possible for him to marry Anne. So there is no longer any reason to feel awkward about talking about him. He's just another person in their life, nothing special. So we see that it's uh, not just the person that makes Anne awkward and embarrassed, it's the history of the person or his current situation of being single uh, in her circle of friends and acquaintances. It's the possibility that perhaps he still loves Anne that makes things so awkward. So if they talk about it in a way where it uh, he seems to love someone else, it's no longer awkward. Question two. The novel mentions that Anne makes visits of charity in the village of Kellynch. What do you think this might say about class relations of that time and why? So let's look at this, page 88. Mm, let's see. OK. Um, so there. Lady Russell and Anne. Anne is now staying with Lady Russell. At this time, they kept thinking of Captain Benwick. Lady Russell could not hear the doorbell without feeling that it might be his herald, which means uh, the person who calls out that he has arrived. Herald is like a xian xingzi, someone who announces the arrival of his boss. And they have these people because, you know, either they're upper class or they're rich or they're both. Nor could Anne return from any stroll of solitary indulgence in her father's grounds. So uh, she sometimes goes on walks by herself, solitary, on the grounds of Kellynch Hall, her father's place. Uh, and it's it's not something that she's supposed to do because she's no longer living there, right? It's the Admiral and Mrs. Croft living there. So it's an indulgence, zongrong. Uh, so she can't do that, nor can she visit, uh, nor any visit of charity in the village without wondering whether she might see him or hear of him. So uh, just as Lady Russell sits at home and always, uh, whenever she hears the doorbell, always thinks, could that be Benwick? Whenever Anne walks around uh, Kellynch Hall or goes to visit the village, she also thinks maybe she might see him see him or hear of him, hear of uh, his situation or his news or gossip. So this, a visit of charity in the village. Uh, what are we talking about here? What is this? So a visit of charity uh, obviously means that she's doing something for kindness. So it's not necessarily business, uh, but it's also not friendship either. Right, because then it would be a visit of friendship. So it means that when she goes on these visits in the village, uh, the people whom she visits think of this as her being kind. Uh, and we're what village are we talking about? 
Um, remember, Kellynch is not just a house. That's Kellynch Hall. Uh, Kellynch is an area. It's a, a, a plot of land. So there's Kellynch Hall, where uh, Sir Walter owns. There's Kellynch Lodge for visitors. Lady Russell also lives on the land. And then there are also other like common people who live on the land as well, and either they rent uh, their house or their land from Sir Walter. Maybe they farm and have to pay Sir Walter taxes, or they may live in the village of Kellynch. That's what this village is. Uh, it's the small community of common people who live on the land of Kellynch. So uh, because Sir Walter and the Elliots are family, uh, sorry, are nobles, are upper class, um, they own the land and therefore they have a responsibility to take care of the people who live on the land. So a visit of charity, that's what that is, where an Elliot goes to visit the common people to see if they can do anything to help if they need anything uh, or if you know if someone is sick to bring them uh, like a food basket or like supplies to hear their concerns. Uh, today in a democratic society, this is now called the town hall meeting where a politician will from time to time go and visit the voters in his district or her district uh, and invite the voters uh, to a meeting to hear any of their concerns uh, or to explain some new government policies to the voters. It's the same thing, uh, but of course, according to a different logic. That's why we don't call it charity anymore. It's not charity, which means kindness. It's a part of a politician's job. We elect them, therefore they have to make sure that our concerns are taken care of uh, when relating to the government. But in that time, uh, it was seen as the right of noble people and upper class people to own the land and the buildings on the land. So visiting them is not strictly required by the law. It's charity, it's kindness. It's morally correct, but it's not legally required. Um, so that sort of explains the class relations of that time. Uh, today, the most important class is the middle class, uh, because middle class people, most of us, um, are the largest group of voters, and policies from the government mostly affect uh, middle class people especially when they have to do with taxes. Uh, usually the working class or the lower class people uh, don't make enough money to have to pay taxes. So government policy usually is not that big a deal in their lives in terms of taxes. Of course, the regulations and the laws uh, still affect them, but the taxes are not so important for them. So today the middle class people are seen as uh, the key group of voters. But it, back in those days, in a monarchy with the king and queen, uh, it is the upper class who are the most important because they are closely, uh, the king and queen have absolute power. Um, that's not exactly true. There were still limits to that power uh, over time. Okay, let, let me back up. So. Originally, the king and queen have absolute power. But in order to effectively govern, to actually uh, do the work of the government, they had to form the government, uh, you know, a group of nobles um, to implement policy, to carry out the orders of the king and queen. Over time, the government grew bigger and bigger as there were more and more things to take care of. And so uh, the government could not simply just follow the king and queen's orders. There had to be a system of controlling the government. That system is called the law. Uh, well, of course, the law also 
uh, restricts common people and noble people, but when the uh, the law starts to restrict the government as well, um, and so uh, the law is not just uh, created by the king and queen. There also has to be a group of people who understand the government, who are therefore more able to create laws that make sense for the country and for the government. That group of people is called parliament. Today, parliament is elected, but at the time, parliament was uh, assigned by the king and queen to nobles, to upper class people. So as you can see, the entire government is made up of upper class people. Uh, it is upper class people who own all the land. So in the in the society of that time, only the upper class people were seen as important. And now, of course, working class people are important no matter in what uh, period of society, because it is working class people who do the farming. It is working class people who work in the factories. It is working class people today who take the low paying jobs that society requires, but that few people really like to do. Um, but they're often not seen as the most important people by the society, um, by the people who live in that society. Um, so that's the class relations of that time. Upper class people matter or are seen to matter more because they control the money uh, and they control the laws. That's why when Anne visits the village, it's called charity. Next question. What values do you think Mr. Elliot's apology to and reconciliation with Sir Walter might appeal to? Why do you think the unfeudal tone of the present day might be a bad thing? Um, so actually, without looking at the text, we can already answer the second half of this question. Feudal in Chinese is feng jin, so it's basically the system of nobles and royalty. So uh, if when Sir Walter, sorry, when Mr. Elliot says that the present day is unfeudal, what he's saying is that the social rules where the upper class and the nobles are the most important and they can decide everything are becoming weaker and weaker. Now to us, that's a good thing because today we live in a democracy. But remember, he's talking to Sir Elliot, a noble who is upper class. So if the feudal uh, at the feudal social logic is becoming weaker and weaker, that's a bad thing to Sir Elliot. Um, so let's go back to the first half of this question. Mr. Elliot apologizes to Sir Walter for uh, ignoring Sir Walter, wanting to have no relations with Sir Walter. So uh, the question is asking us to look closely at Mr. Elliot's apology and to think about the values behind his apology. Why is he apologizing? What kind of things does he say to make Sir Walter more open to accepting his apology? And not just the words that he says, but the reconciliation, which means he uh, So let's take a look at this, page 91 and 92. So. Hmm, let's see. There we go. Um, so Mr. Elliot had now been a fortnight in Bath. This Bath, remember, is where Sir Walter currently is. So he had spent two weeks already in Bath, and his first object, his first goal, on arriving had been to leave his card in Camden Place, where Sir Walter lives, um, and then tries very hard to meet with Sir Walter. And when they did meet, by such great openness of conduct, which again means being very uh, honest and open in his words and behavior, conduct means behavior, such readiness to apologize for the past, such solicitude, which means consideration, uh, to be received as a relation again, 
So like thanking him and like really wanting to be a relation again and desiring to be a relation again. So Mr. Elliot does these things so well that there, which means the Elliot's former good understanding was completely reestablished. OK, so. This is a brief summary of how he apologizes. He wants to apologize. He wants to form relations again. He wants to again uh, be seen to know Sir Walter. So the first thing we see him appealing to is the social value of Sir Walter. Uh, saying by saying that he wants to again be seen as knowing and interacting with Sir Walter, he is sort of flattering Sir Walter's social importance. And we know that Sir Walter cares a lot about his social importance. Um, so let's look at the more detailed part of his uh, apology and explanation, right? He had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side. So remember previously Elizabeth uh, was angry that Mr. Elliot appeared to be ignoring them, but here he is able to explain this away. Uh, he wasn't really ignoring him, right? It was a misapprehension entirely. Uh, misapprehension today we would call a misunderstanding. He had never had an idea of throwing himself off, which means breaking off from Sir Walter. In fact, he had feared that he was thrown off. So look, this is the passive voice. Beidong. This is the active voice. Zhudong. So he's saying he didn't want to break off with Sir Walter. He was afraid that Sir Walter would want to break off with him, but knew not why and delicacy had kept him silent. So like uh, delicacy here means tact, social intelligence. So he knows that it would not be socially polite to bring up, you know, why are you trying to ignore me? So because he's wanted to be polite, he was not able to ask why Sir Walter seemed to be ignoring him. And of course, what he's saying is if he could ask, he would have found out that they were not ignoring him. And so this entire thing would not have happened. Now, if you think back to Elizabeth's version of these events, according to her and according to Anne's memory, Sir Walter tried twice, uh, maybe even more than twice, to get Mr. Elliot to join them for tea and a chat and always he had ignored them. So here Mr. Elliot is also just lying. But it's a it's a good lie. It's a very polite lie. It makes uh, Sir Walter feel like uh, this could be possible. Continuing. Upon the hint of having spoken disrespectfully or carelessly of the family, right? Remember Elizabeth says that she had heard that Sir, Mr. Elliot had spoken poorly of Sir Walter disrespectfully uh, of the family and the family honors. He was quite indignant. He who had ever, which means always, boasted of being an Elliot and whose feelings as to connection, which means relationship, were only too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. So here he's also just lying and protesting that uh, he he so values being an Elliot. It's so important to him. He would never speak poorly of the family. Again, lying, but um, the way that he says this, so we don't get quotation marks, but you can tell that this is from his perspective. Uh, because of how strongly this sentence is communicating his ideas. It's not an objective, uh, cool, detached, recounting of events. It is from his perspective using his emotions. He had always boasted, which means was feels pride about being an Elliot. He had always wanted to be related to them. Uh, his feelings did not fit the unfeudal tone of the present day, which means his feelings were all too feudal. Uh, he supports this kind of feudal social logic. 
And by comparing himself to the unfeudal tone of the present day, when he says present day, he means many people today. So he's saying those people might think it's not as important to uh, maintain relations with noble people, but I disagree. I think the old feudal ways are best. So by contrast, he is making himself look better. He was astonished indeed. Again, a sentence from his perspective. Well, actually, we could we should say the entire paragraph is from his perspective. One small note, ever here means always, but in English today we no longer use it like this. Uh, we use it now to mean once. Have you once? Or at least once, I should say. Have you at least once in your life? Um, he was astonished indeed, but his character and general conduct must refute it. So because he's saying because I am a good man and uh, because uh, I only do good things, I must correct this misunderstanding. He could refer Sir Walter to all who knew him. Uh, in today's English, this is ask anybody who knows me. Um, this, by the way, is the word refer used in this way is the origin of today what we call a letter of reference. Uh, uh, or it, the American term is letter of recommendation. Basically, when you look for a job and they want references, that means a letter of recommendation or people who can recommend you. Uh, so the word references used to mean people. Then that's how this word is being used here. All who knew him. And certainly the pains he had been taking on this, the first opportunity of reconciliation to be restored to the footing of a relation and heir presumptive was a strong proof of his opinions on the subject. So uh, the last point he brings up is that the pains, which means the efforts, that he has been making on the first opportunity to be restored to a relation and heir presumptive argues for his current opinions on uh, how valuable it is to be a part of the Elliot family. So basically in plain English, he's saying, if I didn't think that this was so important, I would not be here apologizing to you. I would not be here trying to re-enter the Elliot family uh, so reconciliation, to be restored to a relation. Uh, the reason we use the word restore is because remember at the very beginning of the novel, Sir Walter is looking at a book called The Baronetage, which is a record of all of the nobles and their relations in England. Now, if the queen or king gets really mad at some noble, they can strip the noble of their title, can remove the title. And so what would happen in the next printing of the baronetage would be that person's name would be erased. Now, if later the king changes his mind and returns the uh, previous noble back to the upper class, that is called restoring his title. Uh, and so the noble's name would then be restored to the baronetage. So when we talk about restoration, we're talking about titles, but when we're talking about titles, we're talking about social relationships. So that's why it is to be restored to a relation. A relation here means a person who has a relationship with a noble family. It's a person. Relation means a person. And heir presumptive. Remember the baronetage said that Mr. Elliot is heir presumptive. If Sir Walter does not have a male child before he dies, then uh, Sir Wal uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Elliot would then be the next Sir Walter. Uh, and of course, this is depending on Sir Walter's OK. He has to approve this arrangement. If he formally removes Sir, uh, Mr. Elliot from the Elliot family, Mr. Elliot would no longer be the heir presumptive. 
So by apologizing and rejoining the family, Mr. Elliot is once again being restored to the place of the heir presumptive, the person who would inherit inherit uh, Sir Walter's title. OK, let's take a step back and look at how he apologizes. It's a very uh, intelligent and persuasive apology. Um, I'm going to yawn. Hang on. <sighs> OK, so. Um, look at what he says and the order in which he says them. Um, first, he says, I didn't want to ignore you. I thought you were ignoring me. And I would have said something, but I was trying to be polite. So the, that's the most important thing, right? Uh, to explain that he himself is has no intention of doing this bad thing. It was simply a misunderstanding. This has to be first. If they don't believe that he uh, was not ignoring them on purpose. Sorry, if the Elliots still believed that Mr. Elliot is ignoring them on purpose, then no matter what he says, the apology would fail. So that's the most important thing to tell them. I didn't do it on purpose. It was a mistake. Uh, then the other thing which could could speak about his ill will towards the family is saying bad things about the family. And here he just denies it. I didn't do that. Uh, next, uh, referring to his own good character and general conduct and saying that there are people who could vouch for him, people who could recommend and guarantee that he is a good person, like he says. Finally, he says, look at what I'm doing now. If I was lying about everything I just said, why would I be here now apologizing to you? But of course, by the time uh, when he says this, logically speaking, he could be doing this for many reasons. But because he knows that Sir Walter is a vain and proud man, he knows that when he says this to Sir Walter, Sir Walter will immediately think, yes, of course, I am so important. There's no other possible reason he would want to apologize to me. It must be because he once again sees how important I am and wants to uh, continue and restore relations with our family. So his apology works because he's appealing to Sir El, uh, Sir Walter's pride as well. So he's appealing to uh, the Elliot family pride and also the Elliot family wants him to apologize and return to the family. They want him to. So even though like his apology is all lies, um, nobody says that's not true. That's not what happened because the Elliots want him back. And as long as they have a reason to think that, oh, you know, maybe he's not that bad a guy after all, uh, they are perfectly willing to pretend that it was all a mistake and a misunderstanding. So his apology appeals to the Elliot pride and the Elliots already wanting him to rejoin the family. I'm going to yawn again. Why am I yawning? Oh, sorry. Um, question four. Why do you think Mr. Elliot's personality makes Anne believe that his marriage was an unhappy one? And, and uh, this is an idea confirmed by Colonel Wallace and Lady Russell. Uh, so the question is saying, uh, Mr. Um, Anne thinks that Mr. Elliot's marriage must have been unhappy. Remember, Mr. Elliot, uh, his wife died. He's currently grieving his wife. He is in mourning. And since I doubt him, I doubt So um, his behavior during this time makes Anne think that his marriage was unhappy. Why? Let's uh, look at this page 97. Hmm, let's see. She was sure that he had not been happy in marriage. Uh, okay, why? So, uh, 
as Mr. Elliot became known to her, so which means as he grew more and more familiar to Anne, as Anne got to know him better, she grew more charitable or more indifferent towards the others. His manners were an immediate recommendation, so he had good manners. And on conversing with him, she found the solid so fully supporting the superficial, because to remember to Anne, manners are only superficial. Uh, so she found the solid, to support the superficial, which means it is as good as his manners. Um, sorry, this isn't Anne. Who are we talking? Who's talking? Uh, sorry, Lady Russell. Uh, this is Lady Russell talking to Anne. Um, so as she as Lady Russell grew to know Mr. Elliot better, she discovered he had great manners. He was a great person, and so she was at first almost ready to exclaim, to shout, to cry, "Can this be Mr. Elliot?" Which means, could this be the same person that the Elliot family had hated for so long? And could not seriously picture to herself a more agreeable or estimable man. So she can't imagine someone better than Mr. Elliot. Remember, estimable comes from the word esteem, self esteem, uh, which means to appreciate or to value, to give a, a, an appreciation of, to, to see and uh, approve of. Everything united in him. Good understanding, correct opinions. Correct opinions here means good morals. Knowledge of the world and a warm heart. So he has a good mind, he has good morals, he has a lot of knowledge, and he is a kind person. He had strong feelings of family attachment and family honor. And this, of course, is referring to the Elliot family uh, without pride or weakness. And he has these feelings not because he is proud of uh, the Elliots or because of some other lower reason, weaker reason, but simply because they are family. This is the best possible reason to love your family or to want to get along with your family is sim because they are simply family. Uh, now, of course, family attachment and family honor are the key to his apology, as we just saw. These are the feelings that he knows Sir Walter and Elizabeth care about the most. He lived with the liberality of a man of fortune, so he is not frugal. He is not stingy with his money. He is not always thinking, oh, we should save money. He lives liberally, which means openly, which means not worrying about money or uh, uh, worrying about any other kind of material situation. A man of fortune without display, so uh, without uh, flaunting his fortune, without showing off his money. And you can tell this is what makes him a truly rich person. A truly rich person doesn't need to show off how rich they are. When you show off how rich you are, that means either that you are not used to being rich or you need other people's approval of your being rich. So what you care about isn't actually your money. What you care about is other people's opinions of you. That's not what a rich person is like. Uh, a really rich person, their friends will all be rich people. So showing off how rich they are wouldn't really matter socially. So a truly rich person doesn't show off their their wealth. Um, so without display, it, this is what really shows him to be a man of fortune. <clears throat> he judged for himself in everything essential without defying public opinion in any point of worldly decorum. So in everything essential, which means in every important thing, in every important uh, topic, or decision, he judged for himself. He himself made his own decisions, which means he didn't ask a bunch of people and then like choose one person's advice to follow. He knew what he should do. 
but he did this without defying public opinion in any point of worldly decorum. Worldly decorum means public uh, politeness. Etiquette. So even though he never asks for advice and he makes his own judgments, his judgment, his judgments never go against public opinion, never go against what people think is the right idea. And this is because he has. Correct opinions, good morals. He was steady, which means uh, consistent, right? Not easily disturbed, not easily agitated. Uh, steady means in Chinese wenzong. Observant, moderate, which means not over emotional, not extreme, not passionate. Passion at this time was seen sometimes as a bad thing because it's uncontrollable emotion. And he is candid, which means honest and open. He never ran away. Uh, he was never run away with by spirits or by selfishness. So to be run away with, uh, right? Because there's a be verb here, so this is be run away with. Uh, so to run away, of course, means you yourself run away. To, but but to be run away with, apparently means to be carried away by, to lose yourself in, uh, to lose your head. Today we might say this. He was never run away with by spirits. Spirits means alcohol or by selfishness. Which fancied itself strong feeling. So he never lost his head when he because of being drunk and he never lost his head because he is selfish in a way that he thinks of as strong feeling. So this is interesting. The novel is telling us that at this time some people uh, thought that their actions were merely because they have strong feelings. But in fact, uh, the feelings that they're talking about are not feelings for other people. They're always feelings for themselves. What they themselves feel about something. And so that's not strong feeling. That's just being selfish. And here it's saying that Mr. Elliot never loses his head because of this kind of false strong feeling, which is actually selfishness. He's never selfish to the point of uh, not knowing what he should do. And yet with a sensibility to what was amiable and lovely. Amiable, of course, means lovely. These two words mean that, or uh, I guess like friendly, friendly and lovely. These two words mean very similar things. Uh, and uh, with a sense of value for all of the felicities of domestic life. Uh, so he not only is like this awesome, amazing person who knows a lot and knows exactly what to do. He also understands the value of domestic life, life at home, the, the life of a woman. Uh, which characters of fancied enthusiasm and violent agitation seldom really possess. So the novel is telling us that people who think that they are enthusiastic about home life and who have strong opinions, violent agitation. To agitate means to 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 uh, make a disturbance, and often it means to make a disturbance in order to change things. So a violent agitation actually means to have strong opinions about something. Uh, so here, the novel is saying many people who think fancy, which means imagine, they think. They, that they are enthusiastic about domestic life, about home life, and who have strong opinions about home life, like what a woman should do, what a woman should not do, what a man should do, what a man should not do. These people seldom really have a sensibility and a value for the felicities of domestic life, a true understanding and appreciation of home life. But Mr. Elliot does have these. So because of this, because of this long description of his character, his behavior, his like perfect personhood, he is like the perfect person, right? Even Lady Russell cannot think of a better person. Uh, because of this, uh, uh, 
she says that she was sure he had not been happy in marriage. You know, I'm starting to think maybe this she is Lady Russell. Uh, no, 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 I think it's Anne. Let's see. Uh, because immediately later we also mention Lady Russell. I don't know, maybe it is Lady Russell because this entire paragraph is from her uh, perspective. So the question is actually wrong. It should be uh, Lady Russell who believes that his marriage is unhappy. Anyway, so um, she was sure that he had not been happy in marriage. Colonel Wallace said it. Colonel Wallace is uh, Mr. Elliot's friend. And Lady Russell saw it. Uh, so like why? Why would the fact that he is such a perfect person uh, make them feel like uh, he was not happy in marriage? Let's take a short break and you can think about this question during the break. Uh, remember, I will keep recording. Uh, you're confused because it was a really long passage, right? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's it's uh, Lady Russell who's talking to Anne about Mr. Elliot, saying that he's a perfect man, and the conclusion is, Oh, he his marriage must have been so unhappy uh, because now, of course, his wife is dead. So they're talking about his past marriage. Uh, so why? Why does the fact that he is such a perfect man mean that his marriage must have been unhappy? Uh, OK, let's take a break.
OK, let's continue. So the question was, why is the fact that uh, Mr. Elliot is such a perfect gentleman mean that his marriage was unhappy? Well, pay attention to why Lady Russell thinks that he is such a perfect gentleman. Um, his manners, <coughs> his conversation. He is a agreeable and estimable man. Uh, he has understanding opinions. Um, he judged for himself. All of these are based on his actions, right? And what he says and what he does. But his wife just died within the same year. We have actually another example of someone who is in mourning for a loved one. Captain Benwick. Now, of course, Captain Benwick uh, perhaps was not the perfect gentleman to begin with, but losing his engaged fiance Fanny surely did not make him uh, a better man. It, I'm sure, uh, worsened his manners and his social uh, interactions because he's sad, right? Fanny has died, but um, Mr. Elliot his wife recently died, and yet he's still able to present himself as this perfect gentleman. And that's why uh, Lady Russell thinks that he must have had a terrible marriage <clears throat> so that now that his wife is dead, he actually feels happier. Um, <clears throat> that's the logic behind Lady Russell's thought. And of course, Colonel Wallace confirmed it. Mr. Elliot's good friend Colonel Wallace also said that he was had an unhappy marriage. <clears throat> um, and Lady Russell continues, but it, the marriage, the unhappy marriage, had been no unhappiness to sour his mind. Which means that his, his like attitudes, his mindset, his personality were not soured, were not ruined, were not twisted by his unhappy marriage. Because, uh, you know, if you think about it, if you if you're married to someone for a number of years and you hate it from start to finish. Uh, after the marriage ends, either because of divorce or because the other person dies, you're you don't just return to the person you used to be. You have been changed by your unhappy marriage. <clears throat> Time doesn't stand still. It doesn't go backward. So here uh, first uh, because um, Mr. Elliot is such a perfect gentleman. Lady Russell has two conclusions. One, God, he must have had a terrible marriage. Two, thank goodness that terrible marriage did not ruin his personality and character. So that's what is apparently going on. Uh, I'll give you a small hint about what uh, you're going to read in the next two weeks, which is. Is anyone really that perfect? Like there's no way someone is that perfect. And we know that Mr. Elliot is already lying, so something is going on here. Uh, we know Mr. Elliot is lying when he apologizes to Sir Walter, so something is going on. <coughs> OK, question five. Anne says that I suppose I have more pride than any of the other Elliots. Do you agree? Why or why not? Uh, OK, so we do know that there is the Elliot pride, right? Sir Walter is pride and vainful. Elizabeth is pride and vainful. Uh, prideful and vain. Sorry, vainful is not a word. Mary also is prideful and vain. We talked about this last week. Um, and it looks like Anne is like the the best one, right? The kindest, uh, the most uh, accommodating, the, the most uh, helpful, the one who thinks the least of herself. Or when other people don't think of her, she doesn't care that much. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Here she says, I suppose I have more pride 
than any of you. Uh, why? Because the previous sentence, what are they talking about here? Um, this is Mr. Elliot talking with Anne. They're talking about how the Elliot family has tried very hard to form relations with Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, who are uh, more important than they are, right? She is Dowager Viscountess, Viscountess Dalrymple. So a countess is, of course, the wife of a count. A Viscount is a slightly lower level count. But this is a dowager. A dowager is the mother of the count and countess. Uh, right, so in Chinese history, Cixi uh, Taiho in English is the dowager empress. Because she's the mother of the emperor. <clears throat> so this is a socially important person. Uh, and her close friend, the Honorable Miss Carteret, which tells us that Miss Carteret is not a noble. But she's a good friend of the Dowager Viscountess, so they are taken together as one unit. So they are related. The Elliots are related, but um, you know, nobles are basically all related to every. Each person is related to every other person in some way. You can call anyone your cousin. Uh, but since Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret are visiting Bath. The Elliots want to cultivate this relation, want to form a relation with them. <clears throat> um, and of course, Anne doesn't really care about any of this. Right, she's the person who doesn't really care about relationships or sorry, relations, formal social important relations. She thinks it's all very silly. <clears throat> and somewhere around here says that Lady Dalrymple has some of the worst conversation in all of Bath. So she's like, why do we need to know this person? Um, so here she says, I certainly do think there has been by far too much trouble taken to procure the acquaintance, which means in order for our family to form this relation uh, with Lady Dalrymple, we have taken too much trouble. We have done too many things. In other words, she says she's saying that this relation is not worth so much trouble. Now, this is the opinion of herself only. Almost everybody else thinks that it is worth knowing Lady Dalrymple. That's why Lady Dalrymple's uh, parties are all full of people. Why everyone talks about her arrival at Bath because she is socially important. But Anne doesn't care about that. She just thinks that it's a boring person to know. So the fact that she herself has one opinion and everyone else in society has the opposite opinion is why she says, I suppose I have more pride than any of you. In other words, she believes that she herself is right and everybody else is wrong. That is also a kind of pride. <clears throat> Now, do you agree? Why or why not? Personally, uh, I think it's probably true, but it's two different kinds of pride, right? Uh, Sir Walter and Elizabeth and Mary, their pride is vain, vanity, self pride. Uh, they are think that they themselves are important. Socially. But Anne here is not saying that uh, she doesn't want this relation because she herself is too important. She's saying that she doesn't want the relation because uh, Lady Dalrymple herself is not someone whom Anne thinks is worth knowing. So she's not saying Anne is not saying she is more important than everybody else. She's saying that Lady Dalrymple should be less important than she is. Uh, this is saying nothing about everyone else. Uh, everyone else's importance does not suddenly change when Lady Dalrymple arrives at Bath for Anne. It changes for everyone else because it's the same one and only social scene. So if Lady Dalrymple becomes the most important social person, 
then everyone else is suddenly less important socially. Um, but Anne again doesn't care about socials. Uh, so it's a different kind of pride. And I think in terms of the novel, because the novel has repeatedly said that Anne is such a good person, uh, I think we can agree that the novel also thinks that uh, the social kind of pride is kind of silly. It's not really as important as the pride that Anne has in knowing good people, having good conversations, that kind of thing. OK, those are the five questions for this week. Uh, do you have questions? No, OK, so let's uh, go back and start from the beginning of chapter 13. Oh, you know, Persuasion has uh, three movie versions. Did you know? Uh, so if you really wanted to, you can go seek out the movies. Um, we're not going to watch them, obviously. We already watched uh, Love and Friendship. Um, but perhaps if you're still confused by this point, um, the movie might help you. Uh, but there is a danger in going to watch the movie, which is movies uh, inevitably change things about the story. You know, to save time or like to appeal to uh, the average viewer uh, who is, of course, not someone who lives in Jane Austen's time. Or something like that, so. If you do watch the movie, you may misremember some things of the story. So when you take the final exam, you may give the wrong evidence for your point. Uh, so that's something that you should be careful about if you decide to watch the movie. Um, OK, so. Um, after the accident, she uh, Anne goes back to Uppercross. The remainder of Anne's time at Uppercross, comprehending only two days, which means making up only two days. Today we wouldn't say comprehend, we would say comprise. To comprise means to include, or uh, it's the opposite of to make up. So if I say this class comprises 45 students, what I mean is 45 students make up this class. Um, but actually the word comprise means the same thing as the word comprehend. It means to uh, uh, encompass, include. Um, but today we don't use comprehend in this way. <clears throat> so uh, the remainder of Anne's time at Uppercross was spent entirely at the mansion house, which is uh, where Kellynch Hall, which is where uh, Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft are currently living. And she had the satisfaction of knowing herself extremely useful there, both as an immediate companion and as assisting in all those arrangements for the future, which in Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's distressed state of spirit, sorry, mansion, upper class mansion, uh, not Kellynch Hall. This is where Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove, the older grandparents, the great house, that's where she is. Sorry about that. Um, so she's it found herself extremely useful as a companion as and in planning for the future, which in Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's distressed state of spirits would have been have been difficulties. Uh, so because of the accident to Henrietta, Louisa, <clears throat> sorry, why am I making so many mistakes today? Because of Louisa's accident, um, Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove uh, are disturbed and distressed, and so they can't really, they don't really have the clear state of mind uh, to do what needs to be done. And so Anne is helping out because we know that Anne is a great and useful person. Ah, uh, film, the one directed by, I think his name was Mitchell, this guy. Um, can I explain number five again? OK, what was number five? I have more pride, so it's a different kind of pride. Sir Walter. And Elizabeth, their pride is a social pride, a vanity. Uh, they take pride in how important they are. On the social scene. But Anne takes pride in. 
like knowing people who are good and who have good conversations and not joining the social scene simply because uh, that's what everyone else is doing and that's what people of the day think is important. <clears throat> so we can say that uh, Sir Walter's pride is a pride that most other people of the time shared, but Anne's pride is uh, according to a different set of values, uh, more focused on honest and personal relationships rather than simply social relations. So, I guess you could say, does that help? <clears throat> OK, I'm sure you're going to give me a reply soon. Uh, but for now, let's go back to what we were talking about. So Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove are so distressed and disturbed that they can't do things right. Uh, so Anne helps them do it. They had an early account, which means report from Lyme the next morning. Louisa was much the same, <clears throat> so no improvement, but also no deterioration. No symptoms worse than before had appeared. Charles came a few hours afterwards. This, of course, is Charles Musgrove. To bring a later and more particular, which means detailed account. He was tolerably cheerful, which means he was not, uh, which means he was trying to be cheerful. Uh, it's a terrible situation, but he tries not to make it seem so terrible. A speedy cure must not be hoped, but everything was going on as well as the nature of the case admitted. Admit here means allowed. In speaking of the Harvilles, would you remember this is where Louisa is staying? He seemed unable to satisfy his own sense of their kindness, especially of Mrs. Harville's exertions as a nurse. This means that they are so kind, especially Mrs. Harville taking care of Louisa. They are so kind that he cannot express how kind they are to his own satisfaction. No matter how kind he says they are, he doesn't think that he says it enough about their kindness. She really left nothing for Mary to do. This is uh, Mrs. Harville. Left nothing for Mary to do. He and Mary, this is Charles and Mary, had been persuaded to go early to their inn last night. Mary had been hysterical again this morning. Now, hysterical, remember, uh, usually it means in Chinese, we also have this term, right? She has a Uh What it means is like, again, losing one's head, being caught up in anxiety and like general uh, irrationality, unreasonable, emotional, emotional behavior, but <clears throat> you should be aware that this word is currently not a polite word to use because uh, throughout history it has mostly been, first of all, it has mostly been women who have been called hysterical. And secondly, uh, in psychoanalysis, Jing San Fen Shi, when Freud was talking about hysteria, uh, he connected it to uh, like some <clears throat> female uh, disorder, mental disorder. He, like he basically just blamed women, um, even though men also sometimes became hysterical. So today we don't use this word. Uh, we we instead we say like uh, it, he was overcome with emotion, or as I keep saying, he he lost his head or he lost control of his emotions, that kind of thing. We don't use the word hysterical. <clears throat> but anyways, that's what this means, right? This morning, Mary had also been like uh, overcome by her anxious emotions, was being unreasonable, irrational. When he, Charles Musgrove, came away, which means when he left Mary at the inn, she was going to walk out with Captain Benwick, which he hoped would do her good. Uh, yeah, at the time, a lot of mental illnesses, the recommended cure was to take a long, hard walk. Either that or to take a long, hard nap. One of the two. He almost wished she had been prevailed on to come home the day before. So to be prevailed on, which means it means to be convinced. Prevail means succeed. 
So to be prevailed on means someone else has succeeded in persuading you. So this is also a kind of persuasion. And it, it fails on Mary. Mary is not persuaded uh, to come home the day before. But the truth was that Mrs. Harville left nothing for anybody to do. So remember, Mary stayed behind at Lyme to help Mrs. Harville. But now Charles is saying Mary really had nothing to do. Now, it's possible that he's just being polite. And what he's really saying is that Mary is simply getting in the way. Because remember, this is how he's describing Mary. He's describing Mary as hysterical, which in this case is the opposite of helpful. So anyways, uh, that's an, probably what's actually happening back at Lyme. Charles was continuing. Charles was to return to Lyme the same afternoon, and his father had at first half a mind to go with him, but the ladies could not consent could not agree, would not let uh, Mr. Musgrove leave with Charles. It would be going only to multiply trouble to the others and increase his own distress. So not only would it be causing trouble to the others at Lyme, it would also be increasing Mr. Musgrove's own distress at seeing what's actually happening. So uh, convincing him not to go and a much better scheme, scheme means plan, followed and was acted on. A chase, which is a kind of carriage, uh, a kind of horse-drawn carriage, Masa, was sent for from Kruk, uh, how do you say this? Krukern? Krokern? Um, usually when you encounter a word you don't know, you can guess how to say it based on how it is spelled. But in England, or I should say in the UK, many place names are so old that their pronunciations have changed over time, even though the spelling has not. So it, the way that it is spelled is not always the way that it is uh, pronounced. Oh, OK, so it is called Krukern. Uh, OK, Krukern. Uh, I guess it must be nearby. A chase was sent for from Krukern, and Charles conveyed back a far more useful person in the old earth nursery maid of the family. Uh, so this in means who is. A far more useful person, in other words, the old nursery maid. Uh, this use of the word in um, is still used today. Um, let me see if I can think of an example. Um, well, you know, this kind of example, right? Uh, a person who is something, something. Sometimes today we would say in the form of. So in other words, uh, a person of authority in the form of the mayor or like the principal. So it's saying like the person of authority that we're talking about is the mayor or the principal. Um, so a nursery maid, the nursery is where you keep the young children in the house where they sleep. Uh, so a nursery maid is the maid who takes care of the children. So of course she's going to be much more useful than Charles. And it continues describing the nursery maid, one who having brought up all the children and seeing the very last, the lingering and long petted Master Harry sent to school after his brothers. So she had taken care of all of the Musgrove children, including the youngest Harry. And here he is called Master Harry because, of course, the maid is the servant and the child is the master of the servant. Long petted, which means that everyone has uh, petted him and like cooed over him and said, oh, what a cute child for a long time. Today that we use the word pet as a verb for our pets, um, but the word pet originally meant like child or someone who you would um, indulge or um, what's the word? Enjoy taking care of something like that. Uh, spoil, huai. Right, so in Chinese, a pet is tongwu. Same logic. Uh, but even now, even he was sent to school, and so the nursery maid was now living in her deserted nursery, nursery, to mend stockings, 
补袜子。And dress all the blains and bruises she could get near her. A blain is a chill blain, dong sang. And a bruise, of, of course, is like when you like hurt yourself. She could get near her. So she's so bored, having no children to take care of. As soon as there's something for her to do, she immediately grabs it and takes care of the person. And who, consequently, which means therefore, was only too happy in being allowed to go and help nurse dear Miss Louisa. Vague wishes of getting Sarah thither. Uh, Sarah is the nursery maid. Thither means over there, to get her there. Had occurred before to Mrs. Musgrove and Henrietta, but without Anne, it would hardly have been resolved on and found practicable so soon. So again, Anne is doing something important. Uh, Mrs. Musgrove and Henrietta had before thought that maybe Sarah the nursery maid would be useful in line, but they could never make the decision because uh, they were so distressed and worried and, and disturbed. But with Anne and her clear head, she was able to make the decision for them. They were indebted the next day to Charles Hayter for all the minute knowledge of Louisa which it was so essential to obtain every 24 hours. So in the in what this is saying is that the next day, the visitor from Lyme is Charles Hayter. He's the one who brings news the next day. Um, and so they are very grateful for the knowledge of Louisa, of her condition, that they really find important and essential every day. He, Charles Hayter, made it his business to go to Lyme and his account was still encouraging. Still here means even more. The intervals of sense and consciousness were believed to be stronger. So interval means a period, a short period of time. Remember, uh, Louisa is mostly in a coma, asleep. Um, so intervals of sense and consciousness means pe small periods of time when she is awake and is aware of what's going on. These intervals of time were believed to be stronger, so it means that she her condition is getting better. Every report agreed in Captain Wentworth's appearing fixed in line, so he's going to stay there. He's not coming back. This is important for two reasons. First of all, because again, Captain Wentworth is not family. Louisa, uh, is maybe it, like people think that Louisa may marry him, may have married him before the accident uh, interrupted their courtship. Um, but really, there's no real reason for him to stay. So the fact that he is staying by Louisa's side tells people that he really does want to marry her. He's already thinking of himself as her family. Now that we know that that's not true, right? We have already read that Captain Wentworth feels very guilty uh, for not having stopped Louisa when she wanted to jump. And so she feel, he feels guilty that uh, she hurt herself. So he's staying out of a sense of guilt, but everyone else thinks that he's staying because he loves Louisa. The second reason this sentence is important is because this tells Anne where he will be. So if she wants to avoid him, she can avoid him. If she wants to go to Lyme, uh, she is now prepared to encounter him. Anne was to leave them on the morrow, an event which they all dreaded. Um, everyone doesn't want to leave apart from Anne because they say, what should they do without her? They, of course, means we. Remember at the beginning of uh, teaching this novel, I said sometimes, even though it's in quotation marks, uh, it's still in the third person. And this is uh, something special about Jane Austen's writing. So it really what, what this is saying is what should we do without her? They were wretched comforters for one another, another. They couldn't even comfort each other. And so much was said in this way, uh, in this way means similarly, similar things, that Anne thought she could not do better than impart among them the general inclination to which she was privy and persuade them all to go to Lyme at once. Um, so, uh, they all are going to Lyme, but they don't want to leave Anne. 
So now this is the perfect time. This sentence is saying this is the perfect time for Anne to express in part means convey to tell to express the general inclination to which she was privy to be privy to something means to secretly know. Uh, this word is related to private. Um, general inclination means uh, what she herself wants. So she's saying this is the perfect time for her to tell them of what she actually wants. Which is to persuade them all to go to Lyme at once. She really wants them all to go. Shoo, go, go away. Now, why is this the perfect time? Because they had already decided that they are going to Lyme. But then they say, oh, what will we do without Anne? So the polite thing to do would be to reassure them that there wouldn't be a problem. They would be fine. Go on ahead. This is the polite thing. But in fact, here by a mere coincidence, the polite thing is also exactly what Anne actually wants. Uh, so she could not do better than to actually tell them what she wants because it's the polite thing anyways. And this is also a kind of persuasion. I keep pointing out persuasions because the final exam might have to do with with persuasion. And remember, persuasion is not simply about trying to convince other people. Sometimes a persuasion is a tendency, a habit. It's on Qingxiang. I guess you should say Qingxiang. Uh, OK, continuing. Uh, she tells them you should all go to Lyme immediately. She had little difficulty in persuading them. It was soon determined that they would go Go tomorrow. Uh, so again, this is also from someone's perspective, someone who is going to Lyme. That person says, OK, we'll go. We'll go tomorrow, which means very quickly. Uh, a group of people going such a large distance takes time. So tomorrow is very quick. We'll go, go tomorrow. Fix themselves at the inn or get into lodgings. Lodgings means a place to stay as it's suited. So, you know, if there is a place at the inn, they will stay at the inn. If there is no place at the inn, they will find somewhere else. That's what it means, as it's suited, depending. And there remain till dear Louisa could be moved. They must be taking off some trouble from the good people she was with. So they have to go and, and take some of the responsibility off the shoulders of the Harvilles, which is polite. They might at least relieve Mrs. Harville from the care of her own children. So they're saying uh, if they can't convince Mrs. Harville to stop taking care of Louisa, at least they could help her by helping to take care of the Harville children. Because remember, Mrs. Harville is taking care of Louisa, but she's also the mother of children who she also still has to take care of. And in short, they were so happy in the decision that Anne was delighted with what she had done her persuasion and felt that she could not spend her last morning at Uppercross better than in assisting their preparations and sending them off at an early hour, though her being left to the solitary range of the house was the consequence. So she is so happy that Anne, for once in her life, got things to go the way that she herself wanted them to go. Because remember, she's always yielding to other people. Her convenience is less important to other people. For once in her life, what she wants to happen actually happens. That she's so happy that she even accepts the consequence of being alone at Uppercross. She was the last accepting the little boys at the cottage. She was the very last, the only remaining one of all that had filled and animated both houses. Animated means to give liveliness, to give a sense of life. Of all that had given Uppercross its cheerful character. A few days had made a change indeed. So this sentence is a transition sentence moving from one part of the story to the next part. And it's saying that, oh, Uppercross used to be filled with people, laughter, cheer, conversation. But now after just a few days, Anne is the only person left at Uppercross. Except for the little boys, and we already know right now that little boys don't matter. Children don't matter. Right, so here it says the last. Oh, but there are boys, but she is still the very last. So children really don't matter. OK, continuing. 
If Louisa recovered, it would all be well again. More than former happiness would be restored, so things would not only be good again, they would be better than before. Uh, this is uh, a, a notion from the Bible. The story of the prodigal son. So the story, uh, the parable, I should say. Uh, so the parable says um, a father had two sons. One son was a bad son and he left home to you know, go travel the world. The other son was a good son, stayed home, take care of the, his father, his mother, and helped it around the house. Uh, one day, the bad son came home, uh, poor, uh, needing money, having accomplished nothing in the world. And the father told the good son to go kill a chicken or something, like prepare a big meal to celebrate and welcome uh, the returning son. And the good son says, why are you so happy that this guy's back? He didn't do anything for you. He didn't do anything in the world. I'm the one who stayed and took care of you. And the father says, uh, uh, that's not how you should think about this. Think about it this way. I used to have only one son around me. Now I have two sons around me. The son who has lost is now come back, and therefore I am even happier than before. Same logic here. Uh, Louisa was already a happy and like cheerful young lady, but after having almost lost her, if she can come back and still be happy and cheerful, then it would be even better than um, just having the original happy and cheerful Louisa. Um, so by the way, the, the parable of the prodigal son, why is that in the Bible? Because Jesus is using, or I guess not Jesus, Yes, Jesus is using this story to explain why God would allow and look forward to uh, humans uh, believing in Jesus and welcoming people back to heaven, even though they have sinned, because it's just like the bad son who left and came back. Anyway, continuing. There could not be a doubt to her mind there was none, Anne, Anne's mind there was none, of what would follow Louisa's recovery. A few months hence, so hence means from now, and the room now so deserted, occupied but by her only, but means only, occupied but by her silent, pensive self, pensive means thinking to herself, might be filled again with all that was happy and gay. Gay means happy. Uh, all that was glowing, and of course we, we talked about how happy doesn't mean happy. Happy means content satisfied. So happy and gay means satisfied and happy. Uh, all that was happy and gay, all that was glowing and bright in prosperous love, all that was most unlike Anne Elliot. Uh, not quite sure if that's true. This is uh, Anne thinking to herself. So she's thinking that she's not uh, happy and cheerful. Uh, we may disagree. Um, hysterical, like uh, being overcome by emotions, losing a sense of reason and rationality. Um, in, in plain English today means losing one's head. You can check a dictionary if you're not sure. An English to English dictionary. Uh, OK, continuing. An hour's complete leisure for such reflections as these. Reflection means thoughts. On a dark November day, ah, so it's November. A small thick rain almost blotting out the very few objects ever to be discerned from the windows. So it's raining lightly. Uh, if you go to the bottom of the page, it will tell you it is a gentle rain, a light rain. But it's thick. Uh, almost blotting out means covering up. A blot is uh, back when they wrote using not pens, but with a feather, you would dip the feather in ink and then the feather would take the ink and you would move the feather onto the paper. And as you move the feather, the ink would slowly come out of the feather onto the page. But if when you move the feather over the paper to where you want to write, it drips ink onto the page, uh, we say that it has blotted the page. Uh, so blotting out means covering up. 
uh, the very few things that you could see from the windows anyway. Uh, because first of all, it's dark and then it's raining. Uh, the, this hour of like uh, poor vision and thinking to herself was enough to make the sound of Lady Russell's carriage exceedingly welcome. Ah, so Lady Russell has arrived. And yet, though desirous to be gone, so she wants to leave, she could not quit the mansion house or look on a do, uh, look an adieu to the cottage. To look an adieu means to give one last look. Adieu means goodbye in German. Uh, so she could not bring herself to look at the cottage one last time. Now, this does not mean she could not look at the cottage. It means she, she could not bring herself to look at the cottage with the sense that this would be the last time. Uh, the cottage with its black, dripping, and comfortless veranda, uh, or even notice through the misty glasses. Glasses means um, windows. The last humble tenements of the village. Tenements means uh, houses. Or not not houses, like uh, boarding houses, places where people can rent. Without a saddened heart. So it's a cold, dark, rainy November evening, or I guess day. Uh, she's bored and she wants to go. Uh, but even though uh, she's bored and wants to go, when she looks on the mansion house and the cottage one last time, she is still filled with sadness, a saddened heart. Scenes had passed in Upper Cross, which made it precious. Ah, this is important uh, to remember. Uh, most people of the noble class at the time, like Sir Walter, think that something is important if it improves their social standing or their status. Uh, but here, Anne says that Upper Cross is important and valuable because Things had happened here. Scenes had passed. It stood the record of many sensations of pain, once severe, but now softened, and of some instances of relenting feeling, uh, which means the feelings are now growing weaker and weaker, some breathings of friendship and reconciliation. Breathing here means it, it is beginning or it is living the beginning and living of friendship and reconciliation, which could never be looked for again. So it will never happen again. Like this in which she could never cease to be dear. Sorry, which and which could never cease to be dear. She left it all behind her, all but the rec recollection that such things had been. So it is not because of the place uh, that and thinks this place is valuable. It's because of the memories, including the bad memories. Pain once severe, now softened. Uh, and she thinks that these are valuable because never again will she have these memories. Never again will she have these experiences here at Upper Cross. Um, is it true? Well, it is true because like uh, according to what Anne thinks and what everyone else thinks right now, uh, Captain Wentworth is going to marry Louisa. So he will no longer be at Upper Cross. So the emotions created by his presence at Upper Cross uh, in terms of the other people and with regard to Anne herself, these emotions and situations will never happen again. Anne had never entered Kellynch since her quitting Lady Russell's house in September. Quit means leave, leaving Lady Russell's house in September. It had not been necessary, and the few occasions of its being possible for her to go to the hall, she had contrived to evade and escape from. Uh, so she didn't really want to go. She had found a way, contrived means to find a way, to escape from going to Kellynch Hall. Her first return was to resume her place in the modern and elegant apartments of the lodge. Uh, sorry, not Kellynch Hall, Kellynch, the land. Uh, so when she first comes back, her first thing was to uh, take up again in the lodge and to, to gladden the eyes of its mistress where Lady Russell is staying. 
There was some anxiety mixed with Lady Russell's joy in meeting her. She knew who had been fre frequenting Uppercross. Captain Wentworth. But happily, either Anne was improved in plumpness and looks. So improved in plumpness means she looks healthier. And looks, which means she looks healthier. Or Lady Russell fancied her so. So either Anne looks healthier, or Lady Russell thinks that Anne looks healthier. And Anne, in receiving her compliments on the occasion, had the amusement of connecting them with a silent admiration of her cousin. Uh, so when Lady Russell says, oh, you look healthier, Anne remembers the last time someone told her she looked good, which is uh, Mr. Elliot, her cousin. Uh, and she also had the amusement of hoping that she was to be blessed with a second spring of youth and beauty. So now that at least two people have said she looks good, she's hoping hey, maybe I will grow more beautiful in my middle age. A second spring. Dear Chun, Hui Chun. When they came to converse, when they came to talk, she was soon sensible of some mental change. The subjects of which her heart had been full on leaving Kellynch, and which she had felt slighted and had been compelled to smother among the Musgroves, were now become but of secondary interest. So the things that her heart had been full on, uh, had been full of when leaving Kellynch, so the things that she most cared about the last time she was here, uh, and the same things which she felt were ignored at Uppercross, now were of secondary interest, were no longer so important to her. She had lately lost sight even of her father and sister and Bath. Their concerns had been sunk under those of Upcross. And when Lady Russell reverted to their former hopes and fears, so when she, she went back in her conversation to these previous concerns and spoke her satisfaction in the house in Camden Place at Bath, which had been taken, and her regret that Mrs. Clay should still be with them. So these are the things they used to talk about. Anne would have been ashamed to have it known how much more she was thinking of Lyme and Louisa Musgrove and all her acquaintance there. Uh, today in English, we would say all of her acquaintances, people she knew. How much more interesting to her was the home and the friendship of the Harvilles and Captain Benwick than her own father's house in Camden Place or her own sister's intimacy with Mrs. Clay? She was actually forced to exert herself. She actually had to try. It did not come naturally to her. She actually had to try to meet Lady Russell with anything like the appearance of equal solicitude, which means like, oh, no, I really do want to hear on topics which had by nature the first claim on her. By nature, because these topics were about her family, the first claim, which means they should be the most important to her. Uh, claim means to to have ownership of. So here it's saying these topics should have the most ownership of Anne here, meaning Anne's attention because they are by nature her own uh, concerns, her own family. And we already talked about the talking about Captain Wentworth. Uh, Lady Russell had only to listen composedly, so uh, put together, not agitated, not disturbed, and wish them happy, them meaning Captain Wentworth and Louisa. But internally, Lady Russell's heart reveled in angry pleasure, in pleased contempt that the man who at 23 had seemed to understand somewhat the value of an Anne Elliot should eight years afterwards be charmed by a Louisa Musgrove. So this is what she's thinking. Eight or nine years ago, Captain Wentworth saw the value of Anne, and that means that he had a good eye because Anne, of course, is valuable. Um, but Lady Russell had them break off the engagement. Now, Captain Wentworth, it seems, only has eyes for Louisa, who is not as good a woman as Anne. Therefore, 
Lady Russell is happy because this proves that Captain Wentworth was not the right man for Anne in the first place. So Lady Russell was in fact right to break up their engagement. That's why it's an angry pleasure. She's angry at uh, Captain Wentworth for not seeing for seeing value in Louisa more than in Anne, but she's pleased because she was right about Captain Wentworth. And the same here, she's pleased that she was right, but she has contempt for Captain Wentworth for having such poor taste in women. OK, let's uh, stop here. <clears throat>